So let's start with the very first credit derivative, a CDS or credit default swap. So most of you must have heard about credit default swaps or maybe read about it in newspapers. So but during the global financial crisis around 2007 ending 2008, uh, these were the products which were uh, which became infamous, unfortunately. Now these are actually good products which will help market participants to manage credit risk to a significant extent. But uh, the overall buildup which led to the global financial crisis that led to uh, and these products being uh, termed as risky products. But if used judiciously, they are immensely useful when it comes to transferring or managing of credit risk on a bank's portfolio. So let's try to understand the structure of a CDS. So this is what we'll do for all other products as well. We'll, uh, we'll learn it through a simple pictorial diagram because once we learn something through a picture, it becomes easy for us to understand the concept which is embedded inside it. So just like any other trade, we'll have two parties which are entering into a transaction, a protection buyer and a protection seller. So as the name goes, protection buyer is, the, is that party which is trying to manage the credit risk or who wants to move the credit risk away from their books. And protection seller is the person who is willing to take on the credit risk or who will purchase the credit risk from the, from the counterparty. So this is what we term as a protection buyer and a protection seller. So these will be two parties between, between which this transaction happens. Now, as the name goes, you see the word swap here. So just like any other swap transaction, you'll have a certain set of cash flows which are involved here. So those cash flows are marked here. And we try and understand the how, what is the exact quantum of these cash flows will be exchanged in our, our subsequent slides. But to understand the basic nature, the protection buyer will keep on making certain periodic payments to the protection seller. So let's say I have a, I have a one year CDS and let's say the frequency has been set to quarterly. So if we plot the simple timeline, we have Q1, we have Q2, Q3 and Q4. And uh, let's, uh, let's take the cash flows from the buyer's perspective or uh, let me mark both of them. So cash flow from the buyer and cash flow from the seller's perspective. Now to understand this better, let's take two scenarios. So we have a scenario one where we say no default. And scenario two is where a default occurs. So let's focus on scenario one for a moment. So in case there is no, and this default is also what we understand through the terminology which we have mentioned here as a credit event. Now what are credit events or uh, how exactly they will be included in your credit derivative transaction. That is something which we'll talk about in a minute. But just to understand the cash flows involved. Now imagine there is no default or no credit event has occurred. Then that will mean that the protection buyer will keep on making periodic payments to the protection seller. And let's say these payments are C. So every quarter, the protection buyer will keep on paying a quantum of cash flow which we are depicting by C, which we also call as the premium. So this will be paid from the protection buyer to the protection seller. So this is the scenario of no default. So nothing happens. So during the one year, four payments get transferred and that is it. The protection seller doesn't have to pay anything. Now let's assume that scenario two happens and not scenario one. So if scenario two happens, that means a default has happened. And imagine that the default has happened at Q3. So that will mean that the first two coupons or what I call as the premiums, these will be paid. So protection buyer will pay C during the first quarter, which is the first, uh, first premium payment. The second premium payment will also get paid during Q2. However, Q3 is the point whereby the credit event has occurred or what we call as the default that has occurred. So because of this, the payment from the buyer to the sellers will cease to exist. That is the remaining two payments will not happen. And at Q3, because the default has happened, then the payment will actually happen from the protection seller to the protection buyer. So this happens on occurrence of a credit event. So in a nutshell, 
the protection seller is expected to make a payment to the protection buyer only if a credit event is to materialize. And once a credit event happens, then the protection buyer is not expected to pay the remaining premium payments. So this is the basic structure of a CDS. Now let's try to understand from the cash flow perspective. So describing, describing the cash flows which you just discussed, the protection buyer is expected to make periodic payments to the protection seller. And this is also what you call as the premium on the CDS. And this will happen until a default occurs. Whereas the protection seller has to make only one payment if a default or a credit event has to happen. Now, after the default or occurrence of a credit event, generally the payment which is exchanged is par value minus the recovery rate. So par value, you can assume as the face value and recovery rate, this is generally de determined on the type of the underlying. So if the underlying is a, uh, is a bank well, it's a bank loan, then generally recovery rate is assumed to be 60%. Whereas for bonds, it is assumed to be 40%. So this is more of a market standard because whenever a bond defaults, uh, there is some portion of, uh, or maybe a bond or the issuer of the bond defaults, and there is certain portion of, uh, of the overall bond payment which can be expected to be recovered. This is what you call as the recovery rate or RR for short. Now we have we have been talking about credit events so here we have listed a few popular credit events which you'll see in credit derivative transactions so the very first credit event can be default or either a complete default or a partial default so it's easy to understand if a borrower or if the underlying that is the if there's a, a underlying bond or maybe a loan and if there is and every loan or bond is going to demand interest payments. So if there is a part default on the interest payments, we call it as a partial default. Whereas if there is a complete default on the interest as well as the principal which is due on, on the underlying, then we say it's a complete or a full default. So this can be a one credit event. Then bankruptcy. So if the uh, issuer files, if you, issuer of the underlying bond files for bankruptcy, uh, then again, that can trigger a credit event. Then credit downgrade. So let's say the underlying issuer has a rating of uh, maybe double A at the time of entering into a CDS. So as a part of the CDS contract, we may mention a condition whereby uh, during the life of the CDS, if this issuer rating is to drop to, let's say A, then this will be considered as a credit event, which will trigger a Pay, pay out on the CDS. So this is what you call as credit downgrade. That is the rating of the issuer is dropping from a better rating to a worse rating. Next can be restructuring. So restructuring is something which we study under what we call as the corporate debt restructuring or the CDRs. So CDRs happen whenever a certain borrower is unable to repay a loan. So even so just to give you a background. Uh, let's say a bank has uh, lent money to a certain borrower and if, if the borrower is unable to make the repayment uh, so what the borrower can do is they can approach the bank saying that uh, and we have run into some problems right now our business is not doing as expected so at the moment we will not be able to repay your loans however the bank knows that the borrower is not intentionally trying to default so that is an assessment which a bank or the lending institution will do independently so uh, after this, what a bank can do is they will enter into an agreement with the borrower saying that let's restructure this loan such that uh, maybe the tenor of the loan can be increased or we can adjust the coupon rate on the loan, etc. However, that will give some additional time for the borrower to return the, return the loan payment which is due to the bank or the lending institution. And this is what you call as the concept of restructuring. So whenever such a restructuring happens at the issuer's end, uh, then that can also be considered as a credit event because restructuring can have different implications and uh, many a times the buyer of uh, the CDS may not be very comfortable with the uh, with the restructuring which can potentially happen or the potential effects of the restructuring. So they may say that we want this to be a part of the credit event. So in case this is to this event is to materialize, then we'll assume that a credit event has occurred and we expect a payout. Next is if the price of the underlying falls below a certain threshold. So let's say a certain uh, price barrier or a price level might have been defined. So uh, assume that the face value of the underlying is 100. Then 
it, it will make, uh, as a part of the condition or as a part of the credit event definition, it may be defined that if the price of the underlying falls to, let's say, 90, then that will uh, trigger a credit event. So this, is, this can be an example of a, a credit event being triggered because of the price of the underlying dropping. Then unwillingness of the bond issuer to make periodic payments to the bond. Now, if the bond issuer says that we won't make payments which are due, then again, naturally, that is considered as a default activity. So again, this can trigger a credit event. Or second is uh, the issuer of the bond may be legally prohibited from making payments. So let's say there is a certain moratorium period which has been declared. So if there is a certain moratorium which has been defined by either, either the regulator or lawmakers, then the issuer naturally cannot make any payments during that time. So uh, that can also be one of the causes of credit events. Now, be it any credit event that will be clearly be mentioned as a part of the CDS contract. So whenever the buyer and seller is entering into the CDS transaction, before they sign on the paper, they know exactly the events which will be considered as a credit event for that particular derivative transaction. Then let's look at what happens at the payment at default. So we have spoken a bit about that in our previous slide when we spoke of cash flows. But uh, looking at what would be the quantum of cash flows to understand that better. So on occurrence of a credit event, three things can happen. So through a dealer poll, we'll try and understand what is the post default price of the asset. So that is what you call as the par value of the asset, which you already know, minus what is the post default price, something which we get through a dealer poll. Then So this difference can be what would the, what can be equal to the default payment on this particular derivative. Or maybe the other thing can be you can have a certain par price plus a certain recovery factor which has been pre-decided at the time of entering into the contract, which can be considered as a payment at default. And the third technique can be the seller will pay the buyer the par value which is the full face value of the defaulting underlying and the buyer will deliver the underlying to to the seller. So this is also what you call as the physical settlement. Why physical settlement? Because the underlying is actually being delivered to the seller. So that's why it's called as a physical settlement. Whereas uh, the other two points, you can consider them as cash settlement. So for any, any derivative, you either have a cash settlement or a physical settlement. Again, uh, the way in which the settlement is going to happen will be clearly defined as a part of the derivative transaction. So both of the counterparties are completely aware as to the technique which will be used for settlement purposes. Then for your exam, the point to remember is in a CDS, only the credit risk is being transferred from the buyer to the seller. So subsequently, we'll see other products whereby there is a component of market risk which gets transferred as well. But for the exam, remember that Whenever a question on CDS appears, it is only the credit risk which is being transferred from the buyer of the CDS to the seller of the CDS.